So, um, we've got an hour, which is, is quite a short amount of time um, because we're going to cover a fair amount of material. So, um, this is the agenda. Hello and welcome. Um, a quick introduction. And then we've got three presenters. So we've got Anthony Hargreaves, who's going to talk about Camtasia, Tom Sewell, digital adoption platforms. Now, I had no idea, if I'm honest, what that actually meant. So I had to look it up. Um, but then I realized I did know what it was. It was just a different name. So he's going to explain that. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about Adobe Captivate at the end. And uh, then we'll have a, a little summary. So some of you have been on these webinars before, not everybody. So if you're, if you're new to this, welcome in. Um, one thing to know is I like orange. I tend to wear orange on these webinars and there's, there's a good reason for that. And um, I, I love e-learning, digital learning, sharing stuff. That's why this is all free and building my network. And you know, you can build your own network really easily. It doesn't cost anything. So this is a great age to be doing this stuff. And if you need to contact me, you've got my email. Um, so we're going to learn about three different digital learning technologies. And what I wanted to do was to, to focus on you know, what, what they are, what they do, how you can use them, and, and what's the real life experience for the users. And I, I guess we've got two types of users. We've got the, the end users who are actually using the, the learning, but there is also us as developers and how you actually get on with the product and what, what's the real life experience of actually using them. And uh, just a quick slide with, with um, some screen grabs of the organizations that we're actually dealing with today. So we've got people from Primark, uh, Charlton House Consultancy, uh, Ultimate Kronos Group, Detango. We've got someone from Walk Me, uh, Thames Water, Leeds Building Society, Northwest Water, uh, Aviva Software, Big Learning Company, GSK, and Avcam. And I may have uh, not worked out where everybody else is from, so you may well be wondering, where's my logo? Um, I just couldn't work it out from your email address. But um, So we've got a good spread of end users and software companies and consultancies. Um, what you may already know so can you remember any digital learning that you've used in the past we, we've all used it most of us have probably built it you know keep that in mind as we go through the session and also have you made a choice of which tool to use have you been in a position where you're advising the client or you're choosing for yourself you know what what tool you might use um, have you used digital learning and been disappointed i'm sure that's happened to all of us and have you had success with digital learning and, and not really known why? You know, that might be something else. So keep these in the back of your mind as we go through the, the demos and presentations. Um, quick question for you. Uh, if you're a mathematician uh, or you've got uh, a kid who's doing homework, you know, this may jump out to you. Can anybody shout out what the next number is in the sequence? Well, 13. Now, what was that? 13, one, 13. Three. Right, Ian, thank you very much. And that is the correct answer. Um, let's look at the question a different way though. Fibonacci number, isn't it? Yeah, what about, it's a Fibonacci sequence number, correct. What about if this was all that you had though? Could we have got a different answer? We got 12. Yeah, you can get 12, because you could have gone two plus one is three, three plus two is five, five plus three is eight, eight plus four is 12. Okay, and you would have got the wrong answer. So you need to know the whole story um, to get the right answer. So the focus really of today is just to give you that little bit of extra info around the three tools so you could come up with a, with a good conclusion. And it might be, I like it, I don't like it, I want to find out more, um, but we'll try and, and, and give you that whole picture. So, um, the next person we have got is uh, Tom Sewell. And I'm just seeing if I can see him in the list. Hi, Key, I'm first, am I, Tom? Yeah, you're up first. Okay, yeah. so 
Um, I'm I was doing... supposed to be first. I'm angry as hell. No, I'm, <laughs> I I'm thought gonna... you were Anthony, but it's fine. I... Yeah, I'm going to put. Uh... Well, actually, yeah. Okay, if you're okay, Tom, we'll we'll go with you first. There you go, Tom. We can see that now. Great. Can you see that now? Yeah, that's great. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Yes, sorry about that. As I was saying, so this is uh, kind of the, the sort of real world adoption reality um, faced by sort of one of the clients that we're working with at the moment. Um, I think this is around 30 user guides where um, they had no other route to sort of getting this information out globally. Um, so they printed, packaged them up and posted them out, as I said, um, so that they could run uh, MS Teams sessions. Um, and that kind of worked, but, but not, not so great. Um, the user experience wasn't, wasn't good. Um, there was no way of collecting feedback either because users were writing in physical pen on the guides uh, as the team sessions were going through. So really not ideal. Um, and, and this is probably quite an extreme example, but maybe some of you guys can, can sort of relate to some of these challenges, especially uh, during lockdown where we weren't able to do uh, traditional classroom training. Uh, and you know there are limitations really to what you can achieve with with uh, things like Teams and Zooms, as I've just really well demonstrated. Um, especially when you're doing a global rollout, multi-language rollout, that sort of thing. So uh, what's a what's a DAP? So um, predominantly, it's a system. Uh, it's a software system that sits on top of a core application. So if you think of uh, your core application being a large scale. CRM or ERP, so your oracles or your dynamics or your SAPs of the, of the sort of large scale enterprise software world, uh, a DAP will sit on top of that and it will provide uh, proactive support to solve any uh, college challenge. And I think the key aspect there that's different to say having a, a second screen with uh, your SharePoint on it or your user guides is that it keeps the user focused in the application. So the, the the guidance is presented at the process point that the user wants it. So it's a kind of shift in, in um, the way that we think as, as, as trainers and people in the training space as to how we get knowledge across to the end users. So at the moment, we're quite push focused. So if we, if we look at the rollout of a, of a new technology, often what we'll, we'll do is we'll say it's two or three hours mandatory training for this module over here and you've got to do it. And at the end, we'll, we'll present you with this lovely quiz that, that Kind of tests your understanding of that knowledge and that journey that you've gone through. Whereas if, when you when you when you're encountering content or support or training within a DAP, it's very much in the other direction. It's a pull-based system, so the user will only ever engage with um, the system when they when they need it at the exact process point where they're failing to understand what the next logical step is or what to do in the step that they're actually in. So it's a pull-based uh, way of learning rather than a kind of we're a transformation program. We're gonna. We're, we're saying you need to do this amount of mandatory training on this module. Um, so we're providing in-app software training and guidance, and we're providing support at the exact point that it's required, and 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 nothing else. Because I think we often assume that everyone needs to know everything from end to end, when the reality is that we have a whole spectrum of of people who understand um, that may understand <laughs> more than others. So at one end of the spectrum, we have people that really need constant hand-holding and even physical support on site to help them through uh, adoption of a new system. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you've got your digital natives that just want to be let loose on the system and they'll tell you when they need help. Uh, and DAP provides a really good way of dealing with everyone that sits on that, that spectrum. Uh, in addition to that, it's it has uh, most DAP uh, work as salt have uh, automation capability within within the system so what we mean by that is that if we've got a high volume task um say i want to i want to have a look in the in the um hcm system for my uh, payslip we can automate what we call dead clicks so it may take seven or eight screen clicks um to get from logging into uh, the hr system to can i view my payslip and what we can do is is once the user's logged in we can automate them through what we say are sort of non-value add clicks. Uh, and that means that we're eventually in a point, if we do that over a number of processes where we can hand back uh, productivity to the business and that becomes part of our sort of uh, case to selling DAP internally in an organization as to the value it will add and the productivity return. Uh, finally, what we can do, which is a really neat, neat feature of um, 
a DAP is most of them come with, with pretty comprehensive analytic engines built into them. So you can see over a period of trend of time where someone is uh, regularly dropping out of um, a process at a certain point. And what that usually tells you um, is that that's the, the, the point of, of resistance in, in, in the uh, process where users are getting stuck. And what that means is you can, you can review that in an end-to-end -end sense and say, hey, that's where I'm gonna target the next set of in intervention around um, where, I, where I put new DAP content in any further iteration of the, the DAP itself. Um, so it's got some really nice features um, in terms of not only um, showing you what's working well, but where you need to go next with, with that capability. Uh, so what are the kind of burning flat platforms, I guess, that, that, that we're facing at the moment or most organizations are, are facing that means that sort of it's, it's now more than ever as a time for DAP. Um, I think what I've encountered in, in most of the organizations that I've worked for is, is generally they have quite an inconsistent approach to, to learning. Uh, certainly in some of the bigger organizations when actually when, you, when, you, when you're dealing with different business functions, say you're talking to finance one day or you're talking to HR the next, they're almost such big organizations that they're, they're micro organizations within that that bigger enterprise entity, so they they tackle learning very very differently. Uh, one might seem uh, one one might deem uh, SharePoint articles or quick reference guides as completely acceptable. The other may may want sandbox environments and and separate environments of of ERP systems or simulations of those environments, and they view that as acceptable. So, what we're trying to do with the DAP is take a, a, a sort of digital first. Um, approach to to learning and i think that has been um accelerated and a catalyst for that for sure is is the current sort of covid situation we're in at the moment where the reality is kind of uh, overnight we've, we've been really restricted as as a, a collection of professionals in the training space where we're no longer able to sort of deploy uh classroom training um, e-learning becomes way more challenging when you're dealing with sort of multilingual rollouts across uh, multiple territories, which an awful lot of large organizations are, are kind of trying to tackle at the moment. Um, limitations to Zoom calls, Teams, teams calls. Um, sometimes it can feel like herding cats on, on, on calls that large, uh, and you've got to have your logistics really nailed down quite tight in order to pull, pull that off at scale. So what the DAP does is it kind of removes any of those um, potential failure factors and it replaces it with, with entirely in-app um, sort of guided walkthroughs and learning. Um, in addition to that, I think what, what, what I'm certainly seeing COVID do to some of our, say, uh, retail clients at, at Charn House is it, it, it's permanently changing their business models. And I appreciate, you know, notwithstanding vaccines and, and how that may uh, change the world back towards what we kind of recognize as sort of normal, I genuinely think that some of the change brought about by COVID is change that's gonna probably stick. Um, and if we look at uh, retail uh, specifically, an awful lot of retail is gonna stay in the online domain. People are gonna continue to want to uh, shop online and have their, their, their food delivered as opposed to flooding back to shops. Um, there won't be a complete pendulum swing back the other way. But having a DAP means you can very, very quickly, remotely and digitally deploy um, <clears throat> new training and content. That means if you needed to pivot, say, 500 or 1,000 individuals to online roles from being in store roles, you can quickly get training and information out to them um, in the application uh, that would enable that kind of pivot of the business model to actually happen on the, on the ground. So that's definitely a bonus of taking a di digital first approach to learning. Um, we've covered the lost productivity push versus pull piece, but just to sort of reiterate that, so it's a, it's a, and it's a critical one, not for a sort of end user or client, but more for us as, as professionals in this space, it is definitely a shift in way of thinking about um, training. So no, we're not saying, you know, here's your mandatory three or four hours of, of modular or process based training anymore. What we're saying is, crack on onto the live system and when you get stuck, just engage with the DAP. You don't necessarily need to engage the DAP from the get-go if you know what you're doing. However, you determine where the point is at which you wanna learn, so you pull on that when you need it. Um, so cost reduction, um, 
yes so there are license costs associated with with a tool like a dap so a walk me or or a, a what fix or an oracle guided learning or a sap enable now but generally what what we're finding is it's it's cheap to to purchase the licenses um for a dap and then implement the content than it would be to to mobilize teams and teams of trainers fly them out globally all that good stuff that that comes around with it so it's always almost a a micro shift in in sort of model for us and ways of working for us as, as sort of professionals operating in that that space. Um, the other thing it does that I'm, we're finding more and more clients grabbing hold of is um, when you deliver when you deliver training as part of a transformation program. Really, you you have quite a, t a, a tunneled or blinkered focus on. I just have this amount of training to deliver. I have it to deliver on on these dates to make sure this community is okay and then i'm out because i'm hitting the, the big red eject button because that's the transformation sewn up done delivered with through hyper care and and it doesn't matter anymore what what clients like about the dap is that um it, it survives beyond the sort of tenure of a transformation program and if you set the center of excellence up right within uh the organization um it's something that that's enduring beyond uh the life cycle of a program and that's ultimately what a, what a business wants you know they're out there buying uh, SaaS based uh, major technology sets like Oracle or SAP um, and they don't want static materials necessarily anymore because static materials have to be updated every time um, there's a, a quarterly release or a, a business process changes within the organization because someone finds a quicker better easier way of doing what they're trying to achieve within uh, the underlying application and there are ways and means in in a DAP of, of automating and keeping pace with the underlying uh, system changes that, that vastly reduce the overhead um, compared to some of the traditional approaches we've taken previously as trainers. Um, so moving quickly on because we want to leave some time just for, for Q&A. Um, so how can we use it? Oh, obviously in supporting transformational activity. So projects, programs, business change, uh, adoption, that, that type of thing, that's an obvious one. Um, it's really useful in rescuing poorly adopted processes and or technology. Um, we had a story recently with a client that had gone live with a, uh, a, a commercial system um, and the buyers that were sort of the main community that were interacting with this, this product lifecycle system really weren't getting along with it. And once we'd introduced the DAP, we were able to untangle some of that existing sort of resistance to change that had built up in the, in the go live and post go live sort of process. So it's really good at, at um, unpicking uh, things that have not gone so well. Uh, and uh, as an obvious one, sort of transitioning away from uh, some of our traditional uh, material sets um, as you know, as with everything, the life cycle of stuff changes and over time you find better and new ways of doing things. And this is certainly sort of our experience at Charlton House of using a DAP. So I think that's probably enough talking from me, Tom. Um, yeah, questions if everyone, anyone has them. And thanks very much for listening. Well, I, I can dive in with a quick question. Um, I'll do my best. Yeah, I, I, I can imagine you've got different types of users. Let's say we've got users who are doing procurement and they do it you know, once a month. I, I can see this will definitely help. What about yeah. the other end of the spectrum where you've got professional users like accountants who are using the same system every single day um, and oh. they have different demands? Is it suitable for that type of user as well? It is. What I would say is, is as with any training needs analysis up front, you would naturally target the, the intervention, the tool set, whatever it is, regardless of whether it's a DAP or you're, you're targeting using uh, PowerPoints or quick reference guides or simulations, you would go where the value is, is, is obviously the most. Um, and if it were a case where you know, a process was fairly obvious or of low complexity or, or so frequently used that there was no forgetting cycle in that, it wouldn't be top of the list to target for a DAP implementation. You would go at the most valuable uh, problematic area of the program or system you were looking at first. Yeah, great. Thank you. Hi, hi, Tom. How are you doing? It's Paul Dollar. Nice to, nice to hear you and see Hello you. Hello again, Paul. How are you? All right? I'm all right, mate. I'm good. Um, yeah, interesting. Uh, 
just a question though. Um, sure. We have on our current client, we, we, we try to do like an 80, 20%, you know, we try and teach them our 80% of it to get, to get going, you know, on a system. What we found though, with this, especially around procurement is they may have about 40 or 50 different scenarios to get to an end goal, right? Yeah. How would DAP handle that? Cause I, I, I haven't seen walk me, but I have seen the Oracle learning, um, offering yeah. and it just basically shows them how to do a basic requisition it doesn't show them what to do in certain circumstances you know with different departments might have to do it in different ways how could it handle that well i guess so way i guess the only reason why i would i would probably answer that question with it with something like a dap solution is if it's gonna if it's gonna solve a problem so are you saying, Paul, that every time they go down different rabbit warrens, there's a problem at the end of every one of those routes? There, we do, certain departments raise orders in different ways, and then they may, to get to a, a certain goal, we've, we've seen it, you know. They all know how to raise a requisition in Oracle, yeah. but it's the different ways they do it and how they receipt it and how they get to, you know, this... I don't know. I'm just looking at it the way I saw the Oracle solution for this. Um, and the Oracle was, solution was fairly sort of linear. It was, yeah, it was very, very generic. This is how you raise an out-of-the-box requisition, sure. but it I, didn't, yeah. I think the answer to that is, is, is again, is similar if, if you were not using a DAP. If yeah. the requirement there was to provide bespoke training because the process was so challenging depending on the individual routes you went, that would be what you'd have to do. Yeah. So you would you would apply the DAP tool set in the same way that you would apply a simulation tool set or a or a traditional paper material tool set. You would have to be explicit about um, the guidance that was specific to that particular user scenario. But going going above and beyond that, if there was a way to uh, automate certain aspects of that, so uh, so that you could remove some of the pain points of that, then that would be an additional functionality in a DAP that you could leverage over and above simulation sandbox or, or standard powerpoints i guess mm. All right. so there are different ways to add value and there are different ways to take away yeah there's adding. challenge there's there's upsides and challenges and on every method isn't there so okay no nice one thanks i'd also, I'd also kind of be inclined to to, to maybe and it's possibly not an option i know it wasn't an option where you and i previously worked if the underlying process is that complicated um maybe that's where the attention needs to be to be turned rather than creating a downstream uh, solution to, yes. to yes. training that many possible scenarios, but it's fine. Yeah, yeah, I can, yeah, I understand what you're saying. All right, thanks mate, cheers. No worries. Tom, I'm gonna have to be the timekeeper here and, and move uh, on. No problem. Um, I, I bet there are loads of other questions. People have got lots and yeah, lots. I, I think my details will probably be in the pack you'll send out, Tom. So again, I'd just if anyone just reach out if you've got anything you want to ask. I'm more than happy to take a question. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Thanks very much. Great, thanks, Tom. Um, Anthony. Hello. Right. Ah, oh, the other Anthony. All oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, anyway, Tom. Hi, Anthony. How you doing? <laughs> I'm good. So, Anthony Hargreaves, can you share your screen? Great. Does that come through? Great stuff. All right, okay. so this is me, um, and I'm going to do a your whistle stop tour of Camtasia. So Camtasia is a um, rapid development tool for doing e-learning videos. I guess you might be able to do more with it, but actually, this is what you this will get you a, a quick a quick win doing it this way. Just to position it, it costs about 230 quid for a user a user license. Uh, so what I'm going to do is run through uh, a really quick scenario of developing some e-learning. Uh, so um, let me uh, close that. Let me flick over to here. And I have here, oh, blimey, shares to stop. Oh, blimey. Right, I need to share my entire desktop. Let's see how I do that. Share. How do you do that in, on this? Advanced portion of the screen. Music, contents, and second camera. Anyone got any idea how you share the entire screen? Uh, well, I think you just share your screen and then alt tab and bring it to the front. Can you see it now? I can see a grid. Excel? Yes. Yeah. Great, there we go, brilliant. 
So I, I'm going to do a quick demonstration of, of uh, creating a, a quick e-learning in Excel. So what I've set up here is some um, uh, a shopping list for fruit and for vegetables. So there's my list of vegetables. Uh, there's my list yeah, of fruit. We can't, we can't see that. We can just see a grid. So oh. maybe we can zoom back out. Bollocks. Hmm. Oh, yeah, that's another thing. Don't swear on a call. Um, hmm. It's been recorded. I, I thought if I did screen, that would share everything. That's it. We got it. Okay. Well, let's see if it yeah. flicks between. Okay. So yeah, I've got a, a list of fruits, list of vegetables, and on my first tab here, I've got a, a basic shopping list. So I'm going to put a drop-down list in there that does switch between fruit and vegetables. And when you go into your shopping list, you'll either see fruit or vegetables, depending on what you've selected over there. So really simple thing to do. And I'm going to record it in Camtasia. So hopefully you're seeing Camtasia still. Yep. Great. It's working now. Fantastic. So Camtasia screen, the, the um, 10 cent tour of that is that in the center, we have the, uh, uh, the display. That's what, you're, that's what you're producing. On the left hand side, we have a, a series of menus which pop in and pop out, allowing you to do various bits like transitions and things like that. And the uh, best one is the favorites. Keep all your stuff you use regularly in there. And at the bottom, we have a, a track where we, we, put our, we put our stuff together and edit it. So I am going to do this, uh, this uh, I'm going to record, record something. What I strongly recommend with all e-learning before you do anything like this is have a, a set of instructions that you're going to do. If you go in randomly, the chances are you'll have to do a lot of editing afterwards. So the, the sharper you are with your initial capture, uh, the better results you'll get. So have a, a good idea, either fully storyboarded or just a list like this. So let me go and record. It'll give me a, a countdown when I start to, oh, I don't want that. Uh, give me a countdown when I start to record. And I'm now going to do as if I was going to record a, um, record a, uh, a piece of e-learning. So click on record and it will tell me, give me a countdown. And off we go. I'm not recording the sound here. I'm just recording my actions. So I'm going to show them the front screen like so. And in my little script, it says, go onto the second tab, explain that you've got a list of fruits and vegetables, a list of fruits and a list of, list of vegetables. Strongly recommend again, when you're doing any of these e-learnings, you, you don't move your mouse too much. Mouse, mouse movement is really bad. So for this, the first thing I'm going to do is create a list and I highlight those and call that um, produce or something like that. So that'll do fine. There we go. And I'm going to highlight that and call that list fruit. And then I'm going to highlight, did that catch? No, it didn't catch. I didn't press enter. There we go. Highlight that one, call that one fruit. Highlight that one, call that one veg. Okay, so in my list here, you'll see that I've got fruit. If I click fruit, it finds it for me. If I find produce, it finds that for me. I'm going to go back to my shopping tab and I'm just going to put a drop down list in here. So we do that through the data tab, go to data validation, pick up list, and I just say where I want my source to be. So I want my source to equal produce. That was a list that I created earlier on. So now when I drop down my list, it gives me either fruit or veg. So all underwhelming stuff so far. I'm then going to put another list in here. So I'll go to my data validation. Say it's got, I want to pick a value from a list. And this time I want it to say equals indirect and the value that's in there. So what indirect does is it basically, it evaluates this equation on the fly and says, I want it to equal whatever's in that list there. So it will equal fruit when it's showing fruit, it will equal veg when it's showing veg. So drop down list, currently showing fruit. Drop down list, currently showing veg. So, uh, and I guess for completeness, then I would copy and paste that. So I've now got my full list so I can go through and pick up my shopping list as I wish and then change to the fruit section and pick up the various things that I want in there. And that, I'm going to press F10 and end my recording. So that was really just a, a, it doesn't matter what I was doing, I was really just get, getting something in Camtasia. So when we go back to Camtasia now, we've got two, two things here. You'll see that I've got something down here in my screen. 
this is my uh, my track, this is what I've recorded, and there's the, the details of the recording that I put up there as well. So if I press the play button, it'll start to play back all the things that I've done. So it'll, it'll work through that and show me all the areas I want to do. So I clicked on produce and, and things like that. So I think the first thing that we did on here was do a little thing up in the top right hand corner there. That's actually quite small to see on the screen. So I am going to add to that bit. I can move backwards and forwards. I'm going to add a zoom to that area there. And you do that through animations and you choose to zoom in. That's right. Whoops, what's that doing there? I've got it on a thousand size, that's why it's so big. So we'll set that at, to start with a hundred percent. Be close, there we go. And oh, blimey, that's not worked well. What's going on there? Oh, it's all gone peak tongue actually. We'll zoom in over there and we want to zoom to that particular section of the screen. And I can control the length of that zoom, how long it takes by extending the arrow in the section there. So if I roll through that, you'll see that it's gonna give me a zoom in on that part of the screen. So when they're working through there, you can see that in much more detail. And when I finish working in there, I want to zoom out again. So I do uh, another animation, bring that back out to full size. And you'll see that down in my screen down there, it's putting in the second animation for me. So just some basic stuff there, you can zoom in, zoom out. I would strongly recommend if you're using this tool, so that's quite a nice thing to do. I've seen people use these zooms quite a lot, whether zooming in and zooming out, it actually makes you feel a little bit seasick. So I'd use that um, sparingly uh, if you're going to do that. Let's have a look at something else we can put in here. So I'm going to whiz through this bit, whiz through that bit, that's fine. And I'm going to come into here. For some reason, my, um, my screen's gone all distended. It shouldn't be doing that. I'll just... I have to do that then. Oh, I'm sorry, it's all gone a bit, that's not working properly, but I'm, I'm really sorry about that. You shouldn't be doing it. I, I've obviously picked, um, oh, that's did it. Fantastic, we fixed it there now. Let's just uh, go back to there actually and set it back to actual size. There we go, magic. Um, so when I get to here, there's another little feature I'd like to show. When we, when we bring up this box here, I'd like to just highlight that area, only that area on the screen. So I can do that by going to my favorites again and choosing a highlight thing. So right mouse click and it will add, add a, a highlight to my current timeline. So it drops it there. You can see it's now started another track for me. This tracks uh, another part of the, the area there. I can control the area that that highlight covers just by dragging it around. And I choose it and I control its duration by stretching this backwards and forwards. So while I'm working in there, still working in there so I need to bring my highlight to there so there you go that's when I finish and I'm gonna switch my highlight off there so those are fairly straightforward things um, let's have a look at some of the other things that we like to do in here um, you can control um, often you'll do things in here where you've made a mistake so did I make any mistakes while I was in here uh, no that's all pretty good um, what I would like to do actually I, I I start to do my work here, where we go into some quite close detail about typing in, uh, that was produce. Um, I'd like to speed up the, the section here where we do two more of those. So the way that I do that is by putting a break into the section there by clicking on this cut tool here. I'll move across here. And that's my other two areas created. I'm going to put another break in there. And then to this particular piece of information, uh, to this particular piece of media, I'm gonna right mouse click and add a clip speed to it. And you'll notice, how do I get rid of those? There we go. On the right hand side of your page, I now have a, a clip speed associated with this. When I'm in another area, it's not there. On that one, I get the clip speed. So it takes 26 seconds at the moment. That's far too long. It's something that we've seen before. So I'd like to go through that a little bit quicker. So I'm going to do that in 10 seconds instead. And you'll see that that's now shrunk down my um, duration for that as well. So when we play that through now, that will go through at double quick speed. Really useful if you're doing things like typing and you're not very good at typing and you're doing two fingers, you can get it to rip through those things really quickly. So that's a nice little thing to do as well. Um, what other bits did I want to show on here while we're, while we're in here? 
we can do stuff like annotations. So there's a, an annotation. I'm going to add that to the timeline on the head. So I've chosen this particular one here, and this is going to say something like hello or whatever on, on my uh, screen there. And I can choose how long that lasts for by stretching it out like so. Okay. So that's how we do record a basic, a, a basic session. Really useful tools, I suggest, are your cutting up tools like so, where you can uh, take sections out. So if you've done a bit where you, you've made a mistake, you can just cut that piece and simply delete it. You can just go right mouse click and, and delete that piece. Out it goes. So you don't want that there. And I can undo with a control Z. What else we want to show? So once you've done your animation, the next part to do is um, your voiceover. So this is actually the really, this is probably the di most difficult part of doing these things. So when you do the voice narration, I'd strongly recommend that you don't do it on the fly, that you go through and you write yourself a script. So let me see if I've got a script that I created a little earlier. There we go, there's my script. So I am going to paste my script into there and start my voice recording. Other tips of voice recording, don't use your PC mic, they're rubbish. Um, one of these headsets are okay, um, or a, um, a, an external mic will do. If you're gonna be in a room that's echoey, don't do that either. Get yourself somewhere with some good padding in there, curtains, or even uh, I, in the past I've put um, pillows, bed pillows around myself to absorb some of the noise so you don't get echoes on there. And so you'd start to record your thing. So uh, we'll, hopefully you'll be able to hear this. I'll click on start and I will start to read through my script and see how I do with it. So this is a sample of a voiceover. Try to speak clearly, try to speak slowly, take your time to pause. And if you stumble over any difficult words, you can stop, keep the bits that you want to keep and ditch the bits that you don't want to keep. So here's my test of this now. So unique New York, unique New York, unique New York. Did that okay? Red lorry, yellow lorry, led, oh, got that wrong. So I made a mistake while I was doing my annotation. So it'll ask me, do I want to save this piece of, uh, this piece that I've done here? Well, actually, yes I do, because a lot of that is usable up until the point where I start doing the red lorry, yellow lorry bit. So I'll say, yes, there we go. And if I play, this is a sample of a voiceover. Here my Try to speak clearly, voice playing try to background. speak slowly, take your time to there pause. There we go, we'll stop that now. It's quite awful hearing your own voice play back. But get to the point where you made the mistake. Red lorry, yellow lorry. Wasn't it? So I think I got through my unique New York's okay. There okay. we go. And I'm going to cut that piece there, delete that piece, and then I can continue to um, continue to do my voice recording now. So. Let's try again. Red lorry, yellow lorry, red lorry, yellow lorry, red lorry, yellow lorry. So you get the idea. And yes, I like that one. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to keep that one. No, nope, I'm going to save that one. There we go. So I'll save that piece. And you can go and build up your narration over the top of this. The other thing that you would do then is while you're doing your playback, if you've got your, if you're happy with your voiceover, it's easier to actually slow, slow down and speed up your video than it is to re-record and make your, uh, so I'd record your uh, voice independently of the video playing as well. Couple of other things while we're here, we can also introduce other media in here. So if I right mouse click on here, it allow me to import media. So somewhere here, I've got some guy talking there we go. So I want to drag that into my screen like that. If I dwell my mouse over it, you might be able to see there's a, a soundtrack with that as well. So I, when this was recorded, there was a soundtrack uh, in the background. I don't want that. I just want, the vo I just want the video. So I can choose to separate the audio and video. And you'll see now I've got video, uh, audio at the top, video at the bottom. And in fact, I'm going to completely remove that sound there and we'll have my talking head in here. So as we play, 
try to speak clearly, try to speak slowly, take your time to pause. And if you stumble over any difficult words, you can stop, keep the bits that you want to keep and ditch the bits that you don't want to keep. There you go. So, so here's my test of this now. So move that around as we wish. So that came in on, on full size. I can slim it down and you can bring in uh, bits of, uh, bits of um, video as you wish. Quite a nice tool actually, good for doing stuff quickly. Um, I would definitely, definitely recommend that you script before you go in, that you plan it out because they're very difficult to edit once you've created them. They're almost disposable. Once you've done these videos, they are where they are. So sign off a storyboard with your uh, clients before you do these and then, because uh, actually editing them, is mu it's easier to throw away and start again. And I think that's me done. So I'll stop sharing. And if there's any questions, please shout up. Thanks, Anthony. I'm assuming there's a, a free download of this. You talked about the, the, the single user license. So like with anything else, you could probably download this and play with it. Uh, you'll, get, you'll get a month's trial with it. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Pretty decent tool. Okay, thanks, Anthony. Uh, okay. Again, if you've got questions uh, that occur to you after today, you, you can find Anthony um, on LinkedIn and his details will be on the um, pack that I send out. Um, so I'm going to uh, share my screen now. Bear with me. Okay, now can you see my slide there, Tom McGuire, top left hand corner? You need to switch over. We're, we're seeing you, the train, we're seeing the uh, presenter's view. Ah, uh, right, okay. Do it again. Okay, how's that? Yep, can you see that slide now? Slide 17, Tom. Yep, great, thank you. Okay, so um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Adobe Captivate. It's, a, it's another tool, it's different to Camtasia. Camtasia, the output is video, it's MP4 essentially. So it's not a SCORM compliant tool. You could load it onto an LMS, and, and serve it from there, but it's not going to um, give you quizzes uh, and interactivity in the same way. So Adobe Captivate is an alternative. So it's one of the top three digital learning tools in the world, it's super popular. Um, content creation tool, so we can build simulations with it. Um, you can build branching scenarios and randomized quizzes, and we can capture the quiz results and feed them back into the LMS and actually keep a record of them. Um, used in all industries, um, it's, it's a universal tool, um, fairly easy to use. I won't say completely easy, I don't think it's as straightforward or as easy as Camtasia, um, but it will do similar things. Provides a complete tool for digital learning and, and feeds into SCORM compliant LMS systems. So uh, the client I'm working with at the moment We've got a lot of PowerPoint materials and we've been harvesting those and converting them into Captivate projects. And that's really easy to do. You basically go into Captivate, you import your PowerPoint and it will create the e-learning for you just as a single click to get you through. So it's another way of presenting the PowerPoint. Um, it's a safe bet. If you buy Captivate, and I'm not selling it, but I'm just telling you what I think, um, it's a safe bet. There's an awful lot of resources out there. There's a massive amount of support for it. Great big community of people who are building with it. So you've got lots of fixes for things, lots of answers to questions when you're working your way through. Um, so what does it do? Well, one thing I mentioned was that it takes um, PowerPoint slides and will produce digital learning for you from them. Uh, you can include MP4s. 
Um, so if you have produced learning in Camtasia, you could incorporate that into a Captivate module if you wanted to. Um, creates click-through simulations easily. Uh, and it is very, very straightforward. You, you line up your application, say you want to record it, and every single mouse click um, that you do will be recorded. Uh, any data that you enter into a screen will be recorded and, and become part of that Captivate project. Um, support, supports branching scenarios for multiple outcomes. Um, so um, if you attended the last webinar I did, I did a quick demo of some e-learning that I built using Captivate. Uh, it was a very trivial example. It was just how to um, choose a coffee grinder and then how to buy it. So you can build one module and build choices in there, lots of mechanisms for doing it, checkboxes, radio buttons, click buttons, um, and then show and hide different parts of that Captivate application. So I think that makes it much more flexible. Um, you can create sophisticated interactive simulations. Something I've seen with a client I'm working with at the moment is they support um, software engineers, but also hardware engineers, and they've got learning on there, um, which has specialized third party widgets that they've integrated into Captivate. Um, you know, so you can turn a dial and it will change something somewhere else on the screen. Um, so if you've got complicated processes, there are things that you can do to support that. Um, it supports responsive projects. That's, that's their terminology for it. And what, we're, what it's actually doing is building a piece of digital learning once, which when you deploy it on a phone or a desktop PC or uh, a tablet, will actually look perfectly good in each environment, but you've still only got the one project that you've built. Um, the actual reality is that you lose some of the functionality. So there are some fancy things that you just can't do if it's a responsive project. Um, but I've, I've tried it, it does work, it's very good. Um, it resizes everything, sorts the fonts out, works really well. And supports variables and actions. Um, if you've got a programming background or you've built macros in Excel, that kind of thing, um, th this will be comfortable for you to do, but not everybody likes doing it. Um, you can create variables and create macros, they call them actions, to take a particular action when you do things like clicking a button. It will check you know, a variable in the background and then decide to take you to one page or another or hide or show things. You can get fairly sophisticated with it, um, but it's not everybody's cup of tea. Um, so how can you use it? I would always start off by building a template with your corporate colors in, font, styles, buttons, um, so that it saves you time later. Create a, a standard way of, way of navigating through the project and communicate that to the users. Um, so if it's just clicking a next button, that's fairly obvious. You may have more sophisticated ways of doing it. Um, make sure it works and displays perfectly on the LMS. This is definitely a, a, a painful point. Um, you can build something, it looks fantastic, it works on your PC, load it onto the LMS and you've got scroll bars everywhere. So there are things that you can do right from the beginning to try and build consistency and, and to make sure things work and fit correctly. Um, consider providing additional PDF and Excel content um, in the LMS. If you overload your Captivate module with extra tables and information, um, it can get very woody, you know, and it gets boring for the user. Much better to hive stuff off into documents and present them in the LMS so someone can click them if they want to see them. Um, consider consider third-party interactions that people build uh, widgets for Captivate, which you can pay for, uh, which will support specific things that you're trying to achieve. Um, real life experience. So people are used to using um, Captivate in a corporate environment and um, the end users will have used it without even knowing to do things like corporate compliance training. Um, and it's the most boring, dullest training you can ever do. But the reason a lot of companies will use Captivate is you can check whether the user has gone from slide zero to 100, uh, if they've done the quiz, have they passed it, 
and and that's going to be very very important um, especially in things like financial institutions where you have to keep a record of people being competent at a particular role um, generally people respond to it well i think if it's done well if it's very focused um, new features tend to be gimmicky um, if, if you're into um, software and gadgets, you like playing with things, every year when Captivate comes out with a new version, they always put extra um, gimmicky features into it. I think the one that came out last year was support for virtual reality. Um, and it sort of works, but it's, it's just too gimmicky. I don't think a, a corporate environment would really use it very much. Um, people don't like being trapped in long running modules. Um, our, our attention spans are definitely getting smaller and smaller. If you do um, a Captivate project that lasts an hour and a half, you know, you're going to lose people. They're never going to get to the end of it. So you need, you know, nice, short, discrete pieces of digital learning, which might be chained together, you know, in a bigger project, um, but keep them nice and short and neat. Um, if, uh, if you're interested in getting Captivate, you can actually get it uh, as a, a download. You can use it for free for a month. It doesn't put any branding on um, any output that you produce. And that's just like Camtasia. They both do the same thing. Um, once you go beyond that month, then you'll have to start paying for it. And I believe that Adobe do monthly license fees now rather than you paying a one-off fee. Camtasia, you can still just pay once and you've got a lifelong license for it. Um, I've got it. Uh, they will charge you for an upgrade each year if you want the new features. And if you don't, you just stick with the, with the version that you've got. Okay, we are approaching the end. Um, any questions for me around Captivate? There was a comment just now, Tom, somebody put up, it's 60 days free, not 30. Oh, is it 60? Right. I believe great. somebody just put that up. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, even better. Um, and it's 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 30 something pounds a month if you then want to rent it for a minimum of a, a year, I think. I, I think for what it is, it's good value. Um, and if you look at some other, other products out on the marketplace, um, which provide digital learning, you know, authoring, some of them are really, really expensive. And we're talking 20, 30 grand, you know, to buy. Um, so I, I think it's good value. It's a good, simple sell inside a company if you're working with them because it, it's cheap to actually do. Articulate it's about a grand or so. Yeah, yeah. Which is quite good. Yeah. You can do videos with them as well. Okay, now I'm conscious of time. We're running out. So I've got just a few slides to finish off. What, what's next? Um, I'm not doing one of these webinars in December. Um, but I'm planning to do another one in January. And um, depending on the feedback I get from this one, where we've got three presenters, I might do the, the, the same kind of scenario. We'll get three people together, we'll pick a subject, we'll pick related things that we want to talk about, and then um, you, know, you, you get to see different faces and meet different people. So I'll, I'll be you know, sending you out a message asking for feedback on today. Um, credits. Uh, Tom Sewell and Anthony Hargreaves are standing up and saying yes when I asked them to, you know, join in. Um, yes. It's time and effort into doing this, um, so I really appreciate them doing that. Um, uh, another colleague, Jackie Wright, who uh, taught me um, Ganya's conditions of learning, which I like to use in my training. Um, slide pack template, the bright orange, um, is by a company called Slide Carnival. I use them. Another colleague of mine, Louise Fielding, a very inspirational person around training. So she um, gave me some advice on this one as well. And um, finally, thank you for joining in. I know you're all busy. You've got um, everything pulling you in different directions. So to make time to do this is really good. And I'm glad you've joined in. And um, I'll send this out in the pack as well. There is links to Adobe uh, for Captivate, TechSmith Camtasia, and also WalkMe. That was another thing that was mentioned. I have no idea how much WalkMe costs, so I put a lot, because um, I'm sure it's more than 33 quid a month. Um, but if you wanted to know, uh, Tom Sewell could help you out. That's one of the tools that he uses. 
Um, I, I'm going to hang around for a few minutes to uh, gossip and have a chat. You're more than welcome to do the same and join in. Uh, but